This morning we're going to be in Romans 14. This morning we're going to be in Romans 14 in the New Testament. And the last time we saw responsibility to neighbors. Again, this is a fantastic portion of Scripture, especially for new believers who are wondering how to live their life now that they've become Christians really need guidelines and and the meaning behind why God asks us to do certain things. Uh, Today, the message is titled, Liberty or Love? Now that's interesting because we have liberty. You know, we have freed from the bondage of the law, from the enslavement of our sin through Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins. We have grace, we have mercy, we have all these wonderful things. We can be free. We don't have to follow the whole Old Testament mosaic system anymore. Jeremiah 31 says, for the most part, you know, the Holy Spirit will tell us what we should do. Um, it's The law is written in our hearts. We want to please God. Uh, so it's a really neat difference in how things were done among God's believers between then and now. However, with this newfound freedom, what do we do with it? Well, today we're going to be the first of a two-part series, two sermons. Uh, Two sermons, four parts today, uh, three or four parts next time, and basically we're going to navigate this. We're not going to rush through it. So we have liberty, but it says liberty or love because sometimes people use their freedoms to hurt others, right? Even in this country, we have a lot of freedoms, we have a lot of rights. There's going to be some times that God asks us to curtail certain things because of somebody else who might be weaker, who might not understand, who might be a new believer, and the things that we do with our freedom kind of freak them out, for lack of a better phrase. Uh, So we're going to look at that. And we're going to, you know, check this out. It's going to be fun. Uh, And I think it's going to be cathartic to a lot of people because there's judgment in here. There's things that people do in a church which which hurt people. And we're going to look at the genesis of that. We're going to look at Um, you know, all kinds of things relating to that subject. So just a a brief digression before we jump in. In our Romans 1 series, we've been doing, taking a few minutes every Sunday to talk about one of God's creations. I picked one. Now, if you're on the church Facebook wall, if you're not, you can jump onto it. Just go onto Facebook, Calvary Chapel Crossfield, and then click group. Say that you'd like to be a part of it. So I do a lot of kind of guessing games and throwing hints about what I'm going to talk about on Sunday. So this morning, if we could roll the video, is the uh, Venus flytrap. The Venus flytrap is interesting. If we could get a video of it, I think we have the picture and the video. Uh, The Venus flytrap is interesting. Actually, if you look, you can sort of see the little hairs inside the lobes. But this is fascinating because this is considered plantae, the plantae kingdom. And we also know that it has some hybridization factors to the uh, Animalia Kingdom. So this is considered a carnivorous plant. And it's interesting because it, you know, these lobes, as you can see them, right? We've got the video rolling. That's its meal. It just doesn't know it's the meal yet. And these lobes, they're convex when they're open. And then when the meal gets into those lobes, it closes, it becomes concave. It's hermetically sealed and the mouth now becomes a stomach. There's little tiny hairs that can barely be seen that um, they have what's considered, I would call it a false false triggering rejection system. And what this does is, yeah, he's he's eventually, he's got three meals now. Um, His buddies were like, hey, what's going on? And you know, they, I'm sorry if this disturbs anybody. Um, but, But it's fascinating if you think about it, the little hairs uh, they don't snap right away. They determine the, the, the uh, size of the insect. They only want to eat certain insects. They can determine the size, the type, whether it's a false uh, signal or whether it's an actual bug because it takes energy for the lobes to close. And you might think, gee, I never knew because I have one. And you might think, I never knew there was so much intricacy built into the Venus flytrap. Uh, it's just one of those things where I used, to, I used to actually install alarms many years ago, and in your home alarm, there's actually a brain that determines these things, but this came first. So false triggering rejection system to save energy uh, and make sure it's digesting the right insect. After a few days, the lobes open back up, and whatever's left of the insect is just discarded, and it starts all over again. It's pretty fascinating, isn't it? 
you know, I, I love to kind of, you know, degrade or poke fun at evolution because here's something that the evolutionists can't really explain. So it's plantae, but it acts like animalia. And are you, you know, are you going to tell me, is there anything in the observable universe where you see plantae make a full transition to animalia? The answer is no. Is it going to grow uh, gastrocnemius muscles and quadriceps, and one day it's, it's going to lift its you know, roots out of the soil, its soil are going to be feet, and then it's going to start walking around? I think not. You could give it billions of years, quadrillions of years, those things will never happen. So it's one of God's creation, and the intricacy that's put into a plant that acts like an animal is really even the, to the, so the, one of the last things I read in one of the sources was the, the Venus flytrap and its mechanisms are still very poorly understood today. No kidding. <laughs> so there you have it, the Venus flytrap. <laughs> one of my hints on Facebook was it was a crossover between two kingdoms. So um, somebody got it. She gets it every time. Jen, she always gets them. Uh, and I'm not tipping her off, but so the last time, <laughs> so we're going to jump in today, and we're going to jump in starting with chapter 14, verse 1, and the Apostle Paul says, receive one who is weak in the faith, but do not dispute, but not to dispute over doubtful things, for one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Just a little caveat, this has nothing to do with diet, we're going to speak about this. I don't want the vegetarians in here getting upset with me. Uh, he says, let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. So one out of four is don't judge each other over un unimportant things. Now the word judge, I did actually a whole sermon when I was, I believe, in 1 Corinthians. Uh, years ago, it's on the, the website. And it just, the Greek words are krino, krisis, anakrino. There's all these Greek roots for what does judgment mean. And the problem with the word judgment, because people throw the word around a lot, is it's poorly understood. And the reason it's poorly understood is because there's a very large semantic range. Judgment can be something like seeing um, you know, a 4-H fair and making a determination on whose animal looks better, which has no uh, implications. All the way on the other end of the spectrum is judgment as in damning to hell. So you can see why even Christians have difficulty understanding this word. When Jesus said not to judge, even as a pastor, I can't look and say, well, you're saved, you're saved, you're not, you are. I don't know these things. God knows the heart, not any human being. So you can't judge in that manner. Um, we can judge behavior at times, but we can't really judge a person's heart. It's not right. So he's saying in this instant, again, one of the many reasons why we shouldn't judge and that's the problem sometimes in the organization called the church when it's misunderstood too many people lean more towards judging too much when the bible says don't do that so does it make god look bad no it makes people who don't know the word look bad and that's why it turns people off to the church so if you've ever been judged on improperly you will find this freeing you will find this cathartic. You may even find this therapeutic as we go through this. So it's going to be good. Receive one who is weak in the faith. Receive means to lead, mean don't discard them. Weak in the faith. This might surprise you. This actually might shock you. Next Sunday, we're going to cover 1 Corinthians 8 with the rest of this chapter because they go together. Someone who's weak in the faith is a legalist. Yeah, I heard, I heard that. A legalist, someone who's judgmental, they're critical. Um, in layman's terms, let's go out of Bible speak. In layman's terms, someone who's judgmental is that, or that weak, weak person in the faith, and this is my explanation, is that annoying person in the church that's always looking to pick on somebody. The person's actually weak. They don't have creativity. They don't understand grace. They don't have original thoughts. They might be insecure. So what they do is they gravitate towards holding you to a standard that they think they should hold you to. The person's weak in the faith. However, well, let's just go back to the context. And I love doing this. I do a lot of study on the Greco-Roman culture, what happened at the time. What's this thing with vegetables? You know, what do you, and people have read this and said, if you're a vegetarian, you're less of a believer. And that's not what it means. You've got to read the Bible in its totality. So, here's the thing. 
if you're a Jew and you come to faith in Jesus Christ and you've been a Jewish person for a long time, let's go back to the first century. You're so used to Mosaic law. You're so used to going to a kosher butcher. You're so used to making sure all the blood is drained out of the animal. But you know when you go to the market in the Greco-Roman culture that they don't follow all those practices. So even though you came to Christianity, you're basically a new believer, but you still hold on to some of those old restrictions that you're not sure that you could let go of yet. So the Jewish person coming to be a Christian who's weak in the faith, who's a new believer, is freaked out by the butcher because they don't use kosher practices. So they just eat vegetables. You're a polytheist. You're a Greek. You're a Roman. You come to Christ, right? You look at these two, this parallel, uh, this parallel flow here. You come to Christ, but you don't go to the butcher either. And the reason why you don't go to the butcher is because what you're used to is that the, the Greco-Roman butchers, because they're polytheists, they're pagans, they would pray over the meat or the animal, and they would kill it, they would sacrifice it, and they would sacrifice it to Apollo or Zeus or Herma or any of these assorted Greek gods, Greco-Roman gods in their pantheon. And you're freaked out because you're like, well, I'm not going to eat that meat because it could, be, it could turn me into a pagan again. Again, you're weak in your faith. You don't realize that the God in you is stronger, the Holy Spirit, than anything in the world. And like if to me, if I went to the butcher or Paul went to the butcher, uh, yeah, I, I pray this in Zeus's name, I'd be like, just give me the burger. And you eat it. You know what I'm saying? You're like, Zeus. There is no Zeus. But if you're not strong in your faith, that bothers you. What the Bible tells us is that we need to make accommodations for the mature believers, but also for the weak believers. We've got to give them a little space. We've got to give them a chance to grow. You see what I'm saying? So, receive one or lead one, right? The weak believer, the legalist. You're trying to help them mature in their faith. Here's the caveat. And you've, you and I, we've all met judgmental people. We've all met legalists. Usually they don't want to be led. Well, a lot of times, because they think they know it all. And they can be very stubborn. They can be very difficult. So the Bible is telling us to have patience, to, for those of us who have maturity, to try to teach them, to try to help them understand freedom, to understand grace, but it doesn't always happen. To us in leadership, what are we also doing when we're trying to help that judgmental legalist person to try to change? We're also trying to spare their potential victims in the church. Think about that. Because it's been my experience, I've been to different churches, that legalists in some churches, they find an enclave, which is really a problem, and some they pass through. But what they do is they, they just look for an opportunity to look at somebody. You know, you come in, they don't like what you're wearing, they don't like your tattoos, they don't like your hairstyle, they don't like their hair color, and they're just looking for a reason to pick you apart. Right, because they're 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 stuck in this tight uh, situation. Verse one, he says, "Don't dispute over doubtful things." I had to <laughs> take out my Greek lexicon and start going into these words because what I wanted to do is I really want you to understand this, and I really want it to come alive to you. The word "doubtful things" doubtful has a tangential connotation of imagination. So if we start to take that to its extreme we could see that some people make rules in the church that are quite imaginary, like a pink elephant. I've never seen one. I don't think they exist, but the Easter Bunny. But what, that's what they start to do, and there's these ridiculous arguments that happen in the church over things not found in God's Word. Now, another caveat, a lot of caveats today, is that if it clearly says in the Bible to do something or not to do, then do it or not to do, follow what the, what the Word says. But a lot of these arguments happen over when the Bible is silent, the gray areas. Well, the Bible doesn't say, so let's now start making up these rules and make people follow them. That's a problem. So let's just give, go through a few examples. Style of worship. I've heard that if a church doesn't have an organ, it's not really a church. I've heard that the church shouldn't have drums or a guitar because they're of the devil. Where do you find this stuff, folks? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, the Bible talks about playing the stringed instruments. Back in the old days, they didn't have electric stringed in instruments, but they had stringed instruments. The Bible speaks about percussion. So why are we getting so legalistic about pieces of equipment that produce sound that we can worship God to? I mean, the lyrics should be edifying. You know, there are some 
some, some loose framework that we should understand. We should be giving glory to God. We're worshiping God. But other than that, people freak out about, I'm sure Pastor Paul is <laughs> happy about this part of the discussion, right? Um, so that's, that's one of the things. Another thing is uh, rites and rituals not found in God's word. Again, if you don't have an old organ, which we don't, it's not a church. If you don't have a dispenser with holy water, it's not a church. Where does it say that? In the Bible, it spoke about anointing with oil. It doesn't speak about holy water. So, you know, again, these things, these rules that uh, are not only put on you, but put on me and leadership. The legalist doesn't, the le person who's a legalist doesn't stop at the congregation. They're critical of everybody. They're pointing their fingers all over the place. And I don't know if they have mirrors in their houses. But even the rapture, you know, and I've seen people <laughs> laughing, right? I'm pre-trib. I'm post-trib. We're not friends anymore. Are you kidding me? I mean, come on. Let's talk about the deity of Christ. Let's talk about Father, Son. Let's talk about the important things. You can come from different denominations that interpret, you know, some of Revelation, as long as it's not blasphemous. And there, there could be, you know, God, Jesus said, I'm going to come back when I come back. I'm not going to tell you when it's going to be. So those kind of discussions, it leaves a gray area, and people argue about that type of things, and I've seen it. It's weird. You know, as leadership, we should not be confusing people. We should help, be helping everyone to understand what the Word says. Amen? So verse 2 and 3, I'll read it again. It says, let not him who eats, meaning, meaning the meat, right? Not just vegetables, but a balanced diet, despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat the meat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Who are you? Oh, let me just stop. That, that's a good part, but I'm going to hold off on that. So verses 2 and 3, right? I get excited. <laughs> so we talked about the, the new believers coming to Christ, Jewish and Gentile background, and why they might struggle over some of these things. But the rebuke, check this out, goes to both parties to the weak believers, to the legalists. Stop judging. Stop being critical. To the mature believer, those of us who have been Christians for a while and understand that this is a silly argument, this is the harder part. To receive them, to lead them, to try to help them understand what they're missing. And again, they don't always want that. But it says not to despise the weak believer. And I'll tell you that when I was a new Christian, and my wife's going to laugh, you know, at the former church that we were at where we got saved, there was this craze that came around like 20-something years ago, and it was cool. Everybody was juicing vegetables. And as some people, you might I have a juicer. It's probably buried somewhere because it's just a lot of work. And I like juicing the celery and the carrots. It tasted really good. Beets, you know, it turned like a purplish when you put everything together. But there was a group of people in the church that everybody was getting juicers and those that weren't were looked down on you're laughing some of you have come from that church and have heard that and maybe they're doing it here i don't know maybe they're just not telling me but you were not spiritual if you didn't juice and t take care of the temple of your holy spirit and they were telling people who had diabetes and sugar issues to start doing this and i would say don't listen to them talk to your doctor before you do that because you're getting it's a whole digestive process where the pulp is separated and the body slows down the digestion. You're getting punched with good, you know, uh, natural sugars, but you still got to don't take people in the church's uh, medical or legal advice. Go see the professional. <laughs> professional. You're laughing because a lot of you have been through this. You've seen it. You've heard it. Um, you know, I mean, even today, people, and again, I had a juicer. I'm not talking bad about people who juice. I'm just saying if you don't, I love you just the same, right? Today, it's the, it's the essential oils, you know? Everybody's doing the essential oils, and this is going to heal you, and this is going to cure cancer, and people throw all these claims out at there, and a lot of you use essential oils, and it works for you. Some of you, it doesn't work for, but you're not more spiritual because you use essential oils. And what they do is they take liberty with that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and pretty much now it opens the floodgates for everything. I'll just throw this out there. And I don't, I'm, I'm not a judgmental person, but I've heard it. Oh, that person is on an SSRI. They're on a psych drug. Okay, well, maybe they're having a, why don't you befriend that person 
find out why they're on it, love them, pray with them, and maybe help them on their journey. There's an emotional issue. They take a pill. They take it a pill. So people take, uh, you know, insulin. Are they less of a person? Come on. This stuff is stupid. I even had a woman, I'm not making this stuff up. We had somebody, he's, he's no longer here. He preached. He was a large man. And this woman, she's not here anymore, thankfully. She couldn't wait to get an appointment with me, and her husband came, and she was bothered that such a large man was preaching. Doesn't he know that his body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? I'm like, maybe it's a metabolic issue. Maybe it's a thyroid issue. The husband was in, in the meeting, and he was like this. He goes, I don't even want to be here. This is embarrassing. I mean, seriously. You know what I said to her? I said, you're, you're a fitness person. I said, I go to the gym. Did you ever think that maybe people look at us and think we worship our bodies? Maybe we spend disproportionate time making ourselves look good? Now, I always liked fitness. I was working out since I'm 13, but whatever, you know? This is the kind of silly discussions that happen. Isn't it ridiculous? I mean, is it just me? Or, but that's what people do. They just look for a reason to pick at somebody because here's the thing. I, I like giving people advice, but, you know, you do what you want with my advice. When it comes to things that are not specifically in the scripture, don't bother people. You know, you want to do that and live that lifestyle, God bless you. Don't force your opinions on me, and I'm not going to force my opinions on you. Amen? So, a, lot of, a lot of people like that. Verse 4, <laughs> he says, Paul says, who are you to judge another servant to his own master? And he's speaking about the relationship between the Lord and us. We're all the Lord's servants, right? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. So two out of four is, you're not your brother or sister in Christ's boss. The Lord is. Another servant. Again, the Lord. If we're all Christians, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. That means the only one who's lifted up is actually Jesus Christ. We're not supposed to dominate each other and, and the Nicolaitans Jesus spoke about in Revelation. And he said, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. It's such a hierarchy, even in the church, that people are held down. The same class systems we see in the world are brought into the church. And, and Jesus said, I hate the deeds. He didn't say I hate them. He loved everybody. But he said, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Right? God is ultimately our master. He will decide who stands and falls. He will decide what each Christian should and shouldn't do because if we're Christians, we pray and God reveals things to us. And sometimes we're convicted. Like There's the expression, don't play the Holy Spirit in somebody else's life. You could be accountable. You could be a friend. You could be a mentor. But you have to stop short at forcing them to do your will. You want to lead them to the Scripture and let the Lord lead them and let the Holy Spirit and prayer and the reading of the Word lead them, not for us to do. Some come into a church, and they think they're everyone's boss. Yeah, they walk around like a manager. You know, they're like bossy. That's just annoying. I just, we, I, we, we won't have that here. And some people have left because of that type of behavior. Go do that somewhere else. Don't do that here. And you know what's interesting? When, and <laughs> when bossy people, critical spirits, end up finally leaving, I've had an interesting thing. It doesn't happen a lot. But then I find that other people come back to the church because they heard. Well, you're back. That person, and they'll tell me, that person really hurt me. And I get mad because I knew something was going on, but I didn't know the great details because I'm a shepherd. I care for the sheep. And when people act like that, go somewhere else and do that. We don't want that behavior here. Again, you try to love them. You try to lead them. You try to soften them. But at the end of the day, some don't want that. They just want to stay in what I would call their sin. Verse 5 through 6. One person esteems, now we're going from food to days. Uh, all, again, all the arguments that people could have. Here's another one. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. For he who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. For he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. 
common sense. Now, this, is a, this guy's a Hebrew scholar who wrote this, who became a believer. And I love the way he shifts gears from doctrine to pragmatic understanding of how to live our lives. Amen? So what he does is he gives an, another example. He went from food to observance of days. Now, I, I used to, um, I guess you could say debate. They came to my mom's house, and she called me up. She goes, I don't know what they're saying. You know, people, they knock at your door. Seventh-day Adventists. And they say, you know, if you're a nurse or a police officer, you're in sin if you work on Saturday Sabbath, and, you know, you have to quit your job. Like, crazy stuff. Because the right way to worship is to worship on the Saturday Sabbath. Right? Seventh-day Adventists. Which is fine if they want to do that. But it's not reflected in Scripture. In Acts 15, in Jerusalem Council, the apostles said, okay, so... And again, it's surprising to many. The church started as a Jewish thing. So when all of a sudden these Gentiles started coming in, they had this big meeting, and they said, all right, what do we do? All these Gentiles are coming in. There's a, we don't understand them. They don't understand us, but they want Jesus. You know, we're mostly Jewish receiving Jesus. Like, what do we tell them? Do they have to, and this was the question, do they have to become Jews first before they become Christians? The answer was no. How much of the Mosaic law do they have to follow? So what they were trying to do is, is have a council and discuss through prayer and the word what these Gentiles coming into the faith were supposed to do. A lot of these things went by the wayside. They didn't have to keep the ceremonial rites. They didn't have to uh, observe certain days. So here you got the Seventh-day Adventists saying, no, 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 you have to, but why are you bringing people back into legalism? And my thing to them is they are so fervent about worshiping God on Saturday. God bless them. <laughs> Just don't impose your fervency on me. I do it on Sunday, and the reason I do it on Sunday is because Christ rise, he rose on Sunday. It's the day of new belief, uh, beginnings. He started all over again. That's why Christians worship on Sunday. What's the big deal? Am I upset about the Seventh-day Adventists? They could worship the God on Tuesday. <laughs> I don't care when they worship the Lord. Just don't tell me I have to follow what you say because it's not reflected in Scripture. Listen. Some people are a little OCD about serving God, and God bless them. You know, they look at certain days, and they're very strict. They have certain rites and foods. And what he's saying is they think that they're serving the Lord out of their heart. So who am I to say, that's stupid? But don't look at me and say, I'm an apostate because I'm not doing what you do. Right? Amen. Verse 5. I've already had a lot of people say to me, oh, I can't wait for this message because I've been hurt at churches. I've been judged. I've been that person that, you know, that critical spirit would come in and point fingers at me. And everything I did, this he or she had a problem with. It's sad. Verse 5, he said, let everyone be convinced in his own mind. Now, caveat, <laughs> the third one, I think, that doesn't mean convinced in your own mind you could just do whatever you want and God will be fine with it. We talked about, and it's, you read these articles and then I have to vet them. Is this like fake news or is this, did this really happen? And I find out these things are so outlandish that I do some research and realize, well, it really did happen. I go down to the local papers of that area and they, it, it's picked up by the local media, but the, you know, the church of uh, smoking pot or doing drugs, it's like they get together and how can you concentrate on anything in the word when you're doing that stuff? It's a little weird. The Bible does speak about being under the influence, right? Uh, also, the, the weird thing that I read a few months ago about the church where everybody gets in there and they, they are, they're all naked. I mean, I'm using extreme examples. This is not common, okay? Has anybody pay attention when that happens? But um, it, it's weird. It's extreme. And God's Word does cover those things. So don't do it. You know what I'm saying? We're speaking about gray areas. We're speaking about things where it's silent. Sometimes it's silent because the Lord... It's not that big of a deal to him. He doesn't need to run every single, you know, what, what color clothes you should wear to church. You know, reds and blacks are great, but greens and blues are not so great. Uh, but that, God doesn't care what, what wardrobe you picked out, what colors you picked out. Some of you are vibrant. Some of you wear suits. Some of you wear short sleeves in the winter. What's wrong with you? But uh, the bottom, no, I didn't mean to say that because I just violated what he said. I'm kidding, right? Just to make sure everybody's awake. But these are gray areas, right? Uh, all right, let's move on. Verse 7, he says, For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we're the Lord's. 
For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. So now we're starting to see a connection here. What Paul's doing, it's very beautiful, is he starts to, first he's focusing on problems in the church. And what does he do? He, now he starts to point to Jesus, because that's ultimately the solution. So seven through nine, the third part out of four this morning is that nobody lives in a vacuum. And that's my 21st century explanation of what he's saying. Everything we do in this life affects other people, and we must answer to God. So this really goes back to um, last Sunday's message, the last few messages of loving God and loving your neighbor. They're inextricably linked. They're inextricably linked. For people to say, I love God, and people do that. They get, oh, they get, and that's fine. They're overly emotional. That's wonderful. But in the second, in the next breath, do you snap at somebody in the church? There's some hypocrisy there. And God's like, no, because we covered this. So there's this triangulation when it comes to loving God, right? Loving God, loving our neighbors, and, and, and who we are. But a lot of people like the, the individual and God thing. They like that. They don't like the triangulation part with the others. And that can be a problem because this is the way God wants it. This is the way God wants it. And there may be people in the church who, um, maybe they have been hurt. Maybe this has been your experience, and you're like, ah, oh, I love this, Pastor Joe. Well, you might not like the next part, because the next part is, at some point, you need to move on. You can't live your life as a Christian not liking other Christians. You just can't because you are going to have a hindrance in your walk with the Lord, according to the Scripture. Like he said, nobody lives to themselves, nobody dies to themselves. We don't live in a vacuum. God has designed this organization of the church for us to be together, and people do that. Like, oh, yeah, I do um, all the time, right? I, I never go to any church. I do TV church. That's not what the Scripture says. You're missing out on a huge part of fellowship. Well, I don't like people, or I don't like this, or I've been hurt. I've been hurt too, folks. People have hurt me. I'm the senior pastor here. Over and over and over again. You know what? To me, this is an occupational hazard, getting hurt by people. Sometimes people bite, and they're not nice. They don't get their way. They deceive themselves, and this is what happens. But, you know, the bottom line is we're not our own boss. We're not another's boss. We all answer to the Lord as the boss. And there may be parts, and it's okay. There's parts of the scripture I don't particularly like. That's fine. We're sinners. We're not going to like some parts of the scripture. But we really need to make a better effort at starting to do what the Lord has called us to do. So verse 10, last few verses of this morning. We'll take this in two parts. He says, but why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? So two different people here. The weak, judgmental person, and the mature one who's showing a little bit of immaturity in having very little patience for others that are not like them. You can see this, because there's two different Greek words that are used, and you see that through the chapter, and he's got two streams going on, right? Two types of people that need to get it right. He says, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore. Stop, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. That's fascinating. I'm saving that for the next time. The whole stumbling block thing, that is very, very interesting. So four out of four is my translation. I'm not saying the Bible said this. Mind your own business, <laughs> right? And don't stumble another brother or sister in the Lord. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me expand this, but we did speak about strangers before in the last few sermons. Don't stumble people who aren't, aren't believers either. Don't go out there and say you're a Christian, wear your heart on your sleeve or your faith on your sleeve, and then do things where people look at you and go, and they're not believers yet. And it delays them coming to God because they think they have to be like you and me. I'll put myself in that cat category too. So don't stumble another to not want to be a believer. You know, what do new people think when they come into this church? 
did somebody say hello? Did somebody give them weird looks because they're new? Did And I, I know, I see you. Many of you go out of your way to reach out to somebody who's new. Um, and that's the way we should do it, right? Come out of ourselves, welcome people to the fellowship. Verse 11, as you can see, if it's you have a study Bible or a pew Bible, it's italicized because that means that he's pulling from another scripture. So he gets this from... As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. Paul wasn't saying to him. He's quoting this to the Lord, and every tongue shall confess to God. Now we see this in Isaiah 45. It's reiterated in Philippians 2, 10 through 11. And basically what it says is that Christians are not going to bow to other Christians when we die. God's not going to say to a, a pope or a denomination or a pastor, you know what, you, you receive the worship. I'm just going to kind of hang out up here while all those people bow to you. It doesn't happen that way. When we bow to the Lord, we bow to the Lord. There's no middleman. So we shouldn't be doing it here. And sinful flesh tries to dominate others. It's, it's an aberration of the human psyche. It, it gives a feeling of power and importance. Um, and I'm going to tell you this, that I've seen it. And I've seen it in 16 years that churches have died, they've split. There's churches as we speak that have factions that are slowly dying. And I mean they're not physically dying like death, but the church as an organization is dying because of this stuff. Paul mentions this in 1 Corinthians, you know, oh, I'm of Apollos, that's this group over here. This side is, I'm of Peter. Up there, they're like, well, I'm of Paul. And he's saying, why are you doing that? That's just going to cause schisms in the church. You know, what if people said, I'm a Pastor Joe? Well, I'm a Pastor Vinny. Well, I'm a Pastor Paul. We don't want that here. You need to say, I'm of Jesus Christ. That's what we want here. We're just facilitating what's going on here. We don't need any aggrandation or aggrandizement or acclaim. It needs to go to the Lord. Remember, both sides were wrong. The mature believer was irritated by the weak judgmental and critical Christian. And it's easy for that to happen, but by virtue of being mature, you have to start to see past that and see how can I, I facilitate this? How can I make this better? How can I maybe get, in, get involved when I don't want to, but I know that God has called me to make this situation between th this group better, right? The weak were judgmental. They were critical. They thought they knew everything, and they thought that if they had such a strict adherence to the Mosaic law, that they were on the side of God, and they weren't. So they were both wrong. Verse 10, when he speaks about us giving account, standing before the judgment seat of Christ, or the Bema, and that is the place where every Christian will stand before God, and their works will either be worth something, or God will just have them burned up, 1 Corinthians 3. Now, the person doesn't go to hell, because if you've accepted Jesus, you're good to go. Your sins have been paid for. But your works, God may be like, I don't want that in here. I saw your motives with all these types of works. You did all these things to be seen by people. You did all these things to, to benefit yourself, and you befriended these people because you knew they could pay you back at a later time. First Corinthians 3, those works just burned up. God's like, I don't want that here. But the person is saved because all of us have some good works, and I'll, I'll speak for myself. I have a lot of good works. I probably have some bad works. I know I have some bad works, where when I get to heaven, God will be like, that was stupid, Joe. You knew better than that. And I'll probably I'll be like, yeah, I'm just going to say, yeah, you're right to everything he says, because he's God, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's, I, I come to my own conclusions. I read the scripture and go, I, I talk to myself, okay? Uh, full confession here. And I just say, Joe, that's stupid. You know why you did that. God sees through your motives. And that's the way we need to be. God deals with me. He speaks to me, and I'm like, all right, yeah, that was dumb. Sorry, Lord. Try not to let that happen again. I'll leave, it, I'll leave it at this, or let me just say this one more thing, is that if I did a survey, and they've done all these surveys, top three re reasons people give, people who aren't Christian, top three reasons non-Christians give for not wanting to come to churches, and I've seen this, they just want my money, one of the top three is judgmental critical Christians, right? So let me read this to you. This is uh, Warren Wiersbe's book, Be Right, it's about Romans, interesting title. You speak, how many of you, raise your hand, have heard about the great uh, preacher evangelist Charles Spurgeon? Raise your hand, so, the, so most of you. 
Charles Spurgeon had some works that were burned up too. So let me read this to you. This is a great historical account, and I'll read it to you. He says, two of the most famous Christians in the Victorian era in England were Charles Spurgeon and Joseph Parker, both of them mighty preachers of the gospel. Early in their ministries, they fellowshiped and even exchanged pulpits. Then they had a disagreement, and the reports even got into the newspapers. How sad. When stuff in the church that's dumb ends up in the mainstream media. Spurgeon accused Parker of being unspiritual because he attended the theater. Interestingly enough, Spurgeon smoked cigars. Temple of the Holy Spirit. A practice many believers would condemn. Who was right? Who was wrong? Perhaps both of them were wrong. When it comes to questionable matters in the Christian life, cannot dedicated believers disagree without being disagreeable? I have learned that God blesses people I disagree with. A friend of mine told me one day, and I have learned the same thing. When Jesus Christ is Lord, we permit him to deal with his own servants as he wishes. Spurgeon, the great preacher. Pastor Joe. Amen. You know, Pastor Vinny, Pastor Paul, doesn't matter the title. Sometimes we do things that are hypocritical. Sometimes, you know, in our, in our freedom, in our liberty, sometimes we're not loving. So I'm really going to hit this point home at the conclusion of this when we finish the tra- chapter, but liberty or love. We all have liberty. We have liberty to live our lives the way we want. We have liberty to devote ourselves to the Lord, and some people do it with song. I think if I was singing to the Lord, he'd put his fingers in his ears. I devote myself to the Lord in different ways, different strokes for different folks. We come from different backgrounds, sometimes different denominations. And with our liberty, sometimes if we use too much of that liberty, we flaunt it. We put it in other people's faces. We make them think that they should be more like us because we're real spiritual, and that's a sign of immaturity. So liberty or love, you decide. We'll pick it up next time. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, you are so awesome, Lord. Your word is so powerful, and that's why it's called the living word, that 2,000 years later, in the 21st century, what you said 2,000 years ago is still applicable today. And how? Lord, that we as Christians would read your word more, and the more we read, the more we would do the right thing, and the more our churches would be purified and be better. The more we could get it right at home, get it right in the church, and then export it to the rest of the unsaved world. I would just pray while if there's anybody here, while the worship team is up here, they're going to lead us in worship, that if there's anybody here who doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, maybe you're brand new, maybe you've been coming, that we're going to give you an opportunity to come up to the front, come up out of your seat, receive Jesus. We'll lead you in a prayer. It's not about the prayer. It's not about this place. You could move to Arizona tomorrow and go to another church, and you're still part of the body of Christ. Amen. Our only desire is to facilitate people to get to know Jesus, help you, but not dominate you, love you and lead you, but not smother you. So if that's your desire to come to Jesus, it's just you and him. We don't want to be in the middle. We just want to facilitate it. You come up. Maybe somebody will come up with you, lead you in in a prayer to receive Jesus, and, and you walk with him and enjoy him. You and him enjoy him. You come if that's your desire. Thank you.